Believe it or not, we're still in the early adoption phase of electrification. Sure, EVs have been around for a while now, and yes, Tesla has done a ton to get us to this point, but none of that changes the fact that the technology is expensive, and so are the vehicles. Now, I'm not here to suggest the Nissan Aria does much to move the needle, especially not when it comes to pricing, but the rest of the package is pretty impressive. channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. Okay, so I do want to point out right off the top, this version of the Aria I'm driving is front wheel drive, which I'm totally fine with. Now, if you're not okay with that, you can get all wheel drive, which Nissan calls E-Force. And I find that a little weird. I don't know. It sounds like the militant wing of Greenpeace or something. Pretty strange to me. But anyways, you can get that but keep in mind, there will be a penalty on range. Just like with internal combustion power, it takes more fuel to drive more wheels. Well, the same is true with electrification. It's going to burn more energy, which means you are going to have less range. And on paper, it actually doesn't look that bad. So this one I'm driving has 465 kilometers of range. A sort of equivalent all-wheel drive version has officially 428 kilometers. But you got to look a little deeper than that. You got to look at the real world range. This week, I've been right up around 540 kilometers, which is amazing. That's some of the most range I've ever seen in an EV. This is a big battery pack. It's 91 kilowatt hours. I think it's got 87 usable kilowatt hours. But even still, that is a ton of range. It really does away with the anxiety that I usually feel. And I know a lot of you out there, especially those apprehensive EV folks out there, not so sure about them. Well, this is going to go a long way in helping get over that hump. Now you can get this exact same trim with a smaller battery. I think it's 63 kilowatt hours of usable capacity compared to the 87 you get with this one. This is called the Evolve Plus there's that Evolve. Now, the most impressive thing for me this week isn't just the range, but the actual consumption rate. I've been right around 16 and a half kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, which is just amazing. Yes, it's gone up a bit with some highway driving, but even still, I never went above 17 kilowatt hours and it was quick to drop back down as soon as I was cruising around town. I do have a quick digression here though. I really like that Nissan has used a simplified naming convention for trims with the big battery. You just use that plus at the end so you can get the Evolve or the Evolve Plus. That way you know that the plus has more range. It's got plus range. I really do like that. What I'm not so crazy about is the top of the lineup. Because if you take a look at the Premier, the most expensive trim that you can buy here in Canada, it's got the big battery but no plus at the end. It just doesn't make sense from a continuity perspective. I don't know who was asleep during that meeting, but it is really dumb. Anyways, regardless of battery size, regardless of trim, there is a standard battery warmer, which is pretty necessary in this climate. It's also something I see more and more people looking for because it allows you to precondition the battery to those ideal temperatures to hit a public charging station. That's really key in cold weather. You want to make sure that it's running at that optimal temperature so you can kind of maximize the charging. So having that warmer, that is super cool. And speaking of charging, you can hook up to a DC fast charger. This thing maxes out at 130 kilowatts of speed, which is a little slow in my opinion. I'd rather see something closer to that 170 that you get with the Volkswagen ID4 that's similarly sized, similarly packaged to this Aria. I would say it's kind of the most direct competition. I know Hyundai and Kia let you max out at 350 kilowatts at those DC fast charging stations, but keep in mind those faster speeds are going to lead to noticeable battery degradation in a shorter amount of time. So less speed is actually a good thing. I just like to see a little bit more. As it stands, should take you about 
35 to 40 minutes, depending on battery size, to go from 10 to 80% charge, which isn't too bad, but also keep in mind, that is in ideal conditions. And yes, every time I do one of these videos, some owner will tell me, oh, I easily hit that every single time. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I don't. More often than not, both myself and Jody, we struggle to hit those ideal times. Now this week in this thing, actually not too bad. It took me 43 minutes to go from about a 36% charge all the way up to 97%, but it's pretty perfect. This isn't a wintertime test. That's where you're really gonna notice those struggles. So it's just something to keep in mind. Also the onboard charging capacity, the built-in charger, it maxes out at 7.2 kilowatts, which is a little better than some rivals, but I would like to see just something a little more robust, a little bit more speed in that internal charging capacity. Now, something that this thing has in common with most other purpose-built EVs is a super flat floor all the way through the cabin. You can really see it when you take a look down here between the front seats. This center console, it also moves, it's motorized. Little buttons here, this is standard as well. So you can slide it all the way back, which might seem a little gimmicky, and it is, but it also means your passengers in the back have easier access to the buttons for their heated seats, which are also standard, I should point out. That is super cool. Anyways, it also gives you access to this little slot down here as well as the USB ports. But then when you want your armrest back, you just hit this button and slide it all the way forward. I really think it's cool. Something else that you get here that you wouldn't get in a gas powered vehicle, this glove box in the middle, you know, the firewall has to accommodate all kinds of stuff, bigger engine in a vehicle like this. Well, here, you don't have to worry about this. It's a tiny little electric motor up there. So there's all kinds of space. It's just one more added bonus of electrification that I really like to see. Something that this doesn't have is a frunk, but that doesn't bother me too much. I'll also say the cargo, pretty good. Now, officially, it doesn't look so great. The numbers aren't all that impressive, but when you actually take a look behind the tailgate, I'd say there's plenty of room, even for a family of four to fit, I don't know, a long weekend's worth of stuff in the back. And the same goes with the rear seats, tons of room, tons of leg room. Again, that flat load floor really, really helps. Something else I want to point out, not only are heated front and rear seats standard, so is a heated steering wheel, I gotta say, I'm usually not one to sing the praises of Nissan's zero gravity seats. They've just never really felt all that special to me. But these ones have to be the best execution I have ever experienced. They're also super thin, which helps this space feel that much bigger, but super supportive, super comfortable. The ride is comfortable too. Now, yes, just like most other EVs, it's really hard to hide the weight and the rigidity of the battery pack that spans the floor. So at low speeds, when you combine these low profile tires wrapped around these 19 inch wheels, yeah, you can feel some bumps and pressure cracks making their way into the cabin. But once you're at cruising speed, it is just super supple. It soaks up road imperfections really nicely. This cabin is also super quiet. It's nice and serene. It really does make the drive experience feel that much more special. Something I don't like, there's definitely this weird kind of dead spot in terms of feel in the steering system. Of course, it's an electric system. It's really responsive. It's pretty twitchy, but when it comes to feel, there's just nothing there right on center. Once you get past that, it's fine. But on center, I'm not so crazy about it. And then something else I'm not so crazy about, no proper one pedal driving. This is a big hang up for me. And again, I see some EV owners, owners of EVs that don't have full one pedal driving that say it's not such a big deal, but I beg to differ. And in one way, it's a lot like having automatic climate control. Sure, a manual system can do all the same stuff, but there's something really nice about that set it and forget it type where you can just set the temperature you want and then it's gonna adjust the fan speed on the fly to keep things nice and comfortable. The same sort of principle applies to full one pedal driving. It's nice that it can bring the vehicle all the way to a complete stop. It also means you're recovering that much more energy that you would lose otherwise. So the fact that this thing stops working at right around 10 or 11 kilometers an hour really does bum me out. It means you gotta tap into the mechanical brakes instead of relying on the regenerative stuff. Not so crazy about that, but 
I think I could let it slide, especially because that seems like something that could be fixed later on with a software update. Anyways, like I said earlier, this is a front wheel drive version. It's got the big battery pack, so it's got 238 horsepower to go with 221 pound-feet of torque, which probably doesn't sound like much when you take a look at the EV landscape. Big numbers are all the rage, but I'm telling you right now, it is more than enough. Even in eco mode, this thing takes off when you want it to, passing and merging, nice and easy, but this is not a race car. That is not its intended purpose. It's nice and smooth, buttery acceleration. But you know, speaking of climate control, I'm not so crazy about these ones, these climate controls here. Now, on one hand, I like the fact that they're not embedded in the touchscreen like you get with the Ford Mustang Mach-E or that stupid little panel that you have to toggle between one setting and another with Kia and Hyundai. I don't like those, so I like the fact that there are some dedicated controls here, but they're touch sensors and they're just kind of finicky to use, especially because, I don't know, let's say you want to crank the temperature up. Well, if you tap, it takes a split second before the temperature actually starts to climb and then the same thing applies with the fan speed. So if you wanna just tap it to make it go quicker, it's actually really difficult. It's not kind of meant to be pressed like a button, so it doesn't respond all that well. This panel just doesn't feel all that great. That is one sour point for me. Now, if you want, you can use the touchscreen. You can dive into this climate menu and you can use this little slider or these little arrows on the screen to adjust the temperature. But, but on the fly, it's nice to have the dedicated controls. So I just wish they were a little easier to use. I also wish this thing was just a little more affordable. Now, the cheapest Aria you can get in Canada is about 56 grand before tax. That's for front wheel drive, as well as the small battery pack. This Evolve Plus it's right around 67 grand, and that gives you the big battery, as well as a bunch of extra features, this panoramic sunroof, a head-up display, power tailgate, some good stuff. I'd say this is the sweet spot in the lineup. And then if you want all-wheel drive at the top of the lineup, well, you're going to spend over 72 grand. There's one version that's cheaper than this that has the small battery as well as all-wheel drive, but that does not have much range. Anyways, doesn't matter which one you are talking about. If you are looking for an affordable family hauler that doesn't burn any gas, this ain't it, <laughs> plain and simple. To recap, I like the hassle-free drive experience the Nissan Aria delivers, its awesome real-world driving range, and the standard features it has like heated front and rear seats. I don't like how expensive it is that it doesn't have proper one pedal driving and that the touch sensors are a little finicky. I often get asked what I would buy if I were in the market for an EV myself. And since you can't buy the Volkswagen ID Buzz just yet, I definitely say this thing is on my short list. It's not perfect, but it's smooth and easy to drive, has plenty of range and features, and it looks pretty cool without being too quirky. Where I get hung up is the price. Now, EV technology is expensive and there is no way around that, but even when you take that into account, I'd say this thing is probably five to $10,000 too much across the board here in Canada. If that's not enough to discourage you, I'd seriously suggest checking the Aria out for yourself, including a front wheel drive version like this one.